work, making everybody understand exactly what they need to do and why and how. So if a part of the examination is understanding your basic communication skills, pardon me, that's a fair examination. Don't make that a big issue. We can easily overcome this minimal handicap. My understanding is not the magical name of Tondo. Even they could have balanced just not UPSC law. They are also mortal human beings. I'm sure they also commit mistakes. But on the whole, they're trying to see whether you have the capability, not your language. They're also trying to see if you're from a rural background, if you didn't have really the benefit of privileged education. They're trying to see if there is a spark in you and therefore they're, they're awarding accordingly, on the whole. There are always some problems. No, human beings are not perfectly equal. You cannot bring about total equality. But I am reasonably satisfied that there is a fair amount of opportunity given. There is a reasonably level playing field. Therefore, let us not invent excuses. Under the poorest state, what is that? 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 What is Common sense undi, prapanchangu chartham ayi, knowledge in apply jese sex undi, communicate chagal vite, ee examination chails play. Anavasaranga dhenni pedda bhotan laga chitran chukun nao, there is nothing raw, glamorous or romantic about that. Okay? Don't, don't unnecessarily go with fear. Sir, my question is for Jay Prakash sir. Sir, uh, while giving your speech, uh, you gave an example of how uh, able and noble administrators are not able to do uh, the right things because of political pressure and uh, uh, deficiencies in the system. And uh, you have given some solutions like uh, uh, lateral entry, tenure system and decentralization. But uh, all these uh, changes in the systems are to be brought about by government and parliamentarians and, uh, uh, and they are motivated by narrow self-interest and political interest. So they'll rather uh, choose to, uh, so they, they'll rather uh, go for status quo because that will serve their interests better. So what is the role of citizens or precisely civil servants uh, in bringing about these systemic changes? Because finally politicians have to bring about these changes. So how will they make them to bring about these changes? Because no changes can be brought about uh, by the citizens themselves to upset status quo is very difficult because there are strong vested interests. You know, it's not a new discovery. Machiavelli said 500 years ago that a reformer has the most difficult task. I'm paraphrasing him. A reformer has the most difficult task on hand because he encounters fierce resistance from the powerful few who know what is at stake. They know that their privileges will be gone. The change is not to their advantage. And he receives feeble friendship and support from the weak many, weak multitude who do not understand what is there in it for them. There's always a problem. You're trying to benefit the society at large, but a few powerful Western interests, the politicians, the bureaucrats themselves, the judges, some other powerful interests in society, they don't want any big change because they're quite happy. They may complain. They are quite happy. In an iniquitous system, in a corrupt system, in a dysfunctional system, some people are benefiting at the cost of the country, at the cost of the majority. The majority doesn't always stand by you. Actually, they often attack the reformers. Most reformers, most change seekers were punished, some with death, some with banishment, some with defeat, some with poverty. That is the nature of human history. 
but we must persevere we must know the levers of change unless you have the capacity to understand the levers of change unless you first equip yourself with the knowledge and the skill and the credibility unless you persevere unless you strategize and unless you use opportunities that come from time to time skillfully to leverage change change will not happen i'll give you a sense of changes that are happening in the country don't despair in the past 15 16 years voter registration improvements significant improvements have taken place they are not perfect yet but there is a 90% improvement almost all of it is attributable to lok satta's work single handedly systematically the dreary boring dreary work we have done and pursued with the election commission with many others and brought about some significant changes it's not perfect i'm not happy yet but we are way better than what we were earlier take the disclosure of candidate details the parties didn't want it in 1999 we came out with a list of candidates with criminal records then we forced the issue in 2002 when the supreme court delivered a verdict on a petition filed by some of our friends and we led the movement and all parties opposed it but finally we got a law in place campaign finance law india has an excellent campaign finance law the parties are not apply not the parties are not using it wisely but today if you want to run ethical politics india has excellent framework it happened because of tehalka post tehalka i met every single major leader in the country then nda in power and out of power congress everybody present and former prime ministers key functionaries big leaders of all political parties and persuaded them one by one including george fernandez who was himself accused in tehalka i met tehalka fernandez himself tomorrow in fact i'm going to go over a conference held by tehalka group incidentally and ultimately all parties came together in unanimous law was enacted in 2003 one of the best laws in the world 91st amendment to the constitution which made party defection much more difficult it happened these very political parties came together or take the limiting the size of the council of ministers the cabinet size today it's limited to 10% of the lok sabha size a 15% 10% is what we wanted they made it 15% finally or the assembly size earlier it was unlimited jumbo jet ministries it was possible politicians acted against their self interest the local courts law for 10 years lok sabha has fought for it and ultimately had the privilege of getting it through push the national advisory council and the cabinet a law is enacted in 2009 after left national advisory council the law is in place that we are not using that law in andhra pradesh is our folly but the law now exists a local courts law a law liberalizing cooperatives giving them autonomy a constitutional amendment has been enacted the constitution has been amended every single word has been done by me it should done much better i fought very hard but ultimately you have to you have to follow what the politicians want you can't simply override them after they are elected it's legitimate even if sometimes it's foolish therefore i had to negotiate and finally got a reasonable amendment in place right now the judicial reform national judicial commission is coming in place we worked very hard with some of the eminent chief justices of india justice venkatachalaya justice jay swarma and others and the proposals are now acceptable to both congress and bjp i have talked to each of these leaders it's now in final stages of being enacted through a constitutional amendment an indian judicial service like ias is going to come through in the next year or so because of the work we have done i can cite many more examples it's not easy but you have to persevere you want results in one day you want results without hard work you want credit without accomplishment or you want credit all the time without sharing it with others we must make up our mind do you want a change in india or you want some short term heroes god makes great things happen through people who do not care who get the credit do you want an india which is better tomorrow or do you want a few individuals whose portraits and whose statues are on this country all the time without india being changed you must make up your minds yes change is not easy it's not easy anywhere in the world in the in the, in the united states a simple thing like presidential debate some of you must have followed the presidential debate how many have you followed in the united states the recent debates raise your hands you all must open your minds and your eyes much more if you want to be effective public servants if you haven't even followed american presidential debates in today's world with all these television channels and internet then that means you are too narrowly focused on the richer richer examination not about the way the world and the country are moving what india needs is people who understand things who have burning desire to change things 
But these debates, the first debate was in 1960. But for 16 years after that, there was no debate. Nobody wanted it. Then in 76, because two candidates, both for surprising reasons, one, the then president, Ford, Jerry Ford, he was not elected ever. An unelected man who became president because Nixon resigned. Therefore, he wanted a debate to be able to tell the people that you could be trusted. The other unknown person called Jimmy Carter, he wanted a debate because he was unknown. They had a debate. But even after that, it was not that easy. For 16 years, it became so difficult to have debates in a country like the United States. But after 76, every, every four years, we now have presidential debates. They are continuing. So even a simple reform like that took 16 years. And before that, another 15 years, American Women Voters League worked very hard. Things do change, but they don't change just like that. It requires a dedicated band of people in government, outside, in bureaucracy, in politics, in media and everywhere, who understand what is good for the country and systematically pursue it without self-aggrandizement. Working with the players, sometimes with them, sometimes against them, but at all times for the sake of the country. Don't lose heart. India will change. India will be better off. We can transform this country. A lot of transformation is taking place. It's necessary but not sufficient. A lot more needs to be done. We shall make that happen. Don't ever lose heart. But that requires integrity, commitment, most of all, knowledge and competence and insights and understanding. And a willingness to dedicate your lifetime to changing the country. It will happen. And it is happening. Don't despair by what you read every day. Yes, there are many things wrong. But there are also many things right that are happening. Be optimistic. Independent recruitment body, well, they are transferring and doing from the side. And second question, sir, economic reform. Because I read your news in Hindu, but you are opposing that whatever introduced government of India, FDA policy in 49 and pensions and uh, regarding multi-brand retail. But I want to share my opinion, sir, in this regard. What is, one is, sir, with that introducing, so we don't have economic reform 1991, imagine that because now we have more than 200 plus foreign index reserves. In 2007, we have registered 9% growth rate. Now we have come down nearly 5.2. Now we have fiscal deficit is 5.3%. Inflation is going to 10% at least. Sir, in this region, India don't have sufficient capital to produce. No, you are, you are saying I oppose the FTI? FTI. I am the sole supporter of FDI among all political parties of India. So in this regard, the common people don't know whether it is supporting or not. Common people don't know what is the reform, how to, okay. is it better to have the introduction Satish, or not? first question about the dangers to bureaucrats. You know, let's not exaggerate. Yes, on occasion, there are problems. But please remember, many more political workers and politicians are killed in this country. Journalists are killed in this country. You know, in Punjab, Lala Jagat Narayan, and his whole family was decimated because they fought for Punjab's retention of the Indian Union against the terrorists. Judges were killed. Communist parties lost hundreds of workers, CPI in particular in Punjab, lost hundreds of workers because they fought for the unity of India. Similarly, on occasion in a large and vast nation building project like India, yes, civil servants also are victims. During British time, civil servants lost their lives in the northeast India, in, uh, in the then northwest India what was called Nephi at that time. Yes, on occasion the criminals of butchering our own Krishnaya was killed in Bihar. Some of the IPS officers were killed by some of the rascals. Criminals are in politics. There are some dirty things. But on the whole, on the whole, bureaucrats still are relatively free from risk and physical danger. They are remarkably secure, remarkably well protected both physically and in terms of their careers and income and they are very highly privileged. Yes, there are problems, but the problems they for ordinary people also. The citizens who have committed no mistake, sometimes they are also victims, innocent victims. That is the way of a complex world today. Our job is to make it better, to protect our people, including our bureaucrats. But don't think that bureaucrats are always victims and others are always bad people. I can cite hundreds of instances where politicians are outstanding and bureaucrats are criminal and corrupt both. See that wretched uh, DIG or some other fellow, what's his name? Rathor or some fellow? 
who molested a young girl, driven her to suicide. What's his name? Rathore is on some, I don't remember the name. Haryana Vadu. Puttunda? Believe me, if you have one victim in bureaucracy, you have ten Rathores who are doing that kind of things. All of us are equally guilty in this country, the politicians, the bureaucrats, the judges. Nobody is really free from blame. But in all sectors, there are wonderful people who are willing to do something right if you create the right kind of climate. Collectively, you have to do things instead of blaming each other. Don't be too worried about dangers. If I go out, is there a guarantee that I will not be, die in a road accident? You know, life is ephemeral. We have to do what we can as long as we are there. Fear is not the basis of transformation of a society. About economic reform, you know, the problem is a lack of understanding of what is the role of the state. That's why today I began my intervention with the role of the state. If we don't know what the state is supposed to be doing anywhere in the world, don't put it in historical context, we get lost in some third-rate debate. Much of the debate in India about reform, liberalization, no liberalization is nonsensical. We're talking out of turn, out of context, totally ignorantly. I'm using harsh words because it's true. A state that does not take care of public order, justice and rule of law has no business to exist in the first place. A state that cannot create basic infrastructure of power and transport is unfit to govern. A state that cannot provide quality education to every one of its children and ensure guaranteed health care of quality to everybody and skills and employment is unfit. The state's business is not running a business. If doing, after doing all these things, the state wants to run a business, I have no quarrel. I was a fiery, fiery socialist when I joined government. Everybody during my generation was a fiery socialist. There was almost no exception. Then I became special officer of Isaac Steel Plant, then India's largest public investment of 8,000 crores. Believe me, in 1984, 8,000 crores was a lot of money. Today, 8,000 crores is like some pocket change. I don't know why. <laughs> but in those days, it was a lot of money. Then I realized, as special officer of that plant, that public sector in India is private sector of those in public office. It has nothing to do with the people of the country. It is about pelf and privilege and patronage and petty tyranny and nuisance value of those in government. Government power is used for private gain all the time. Therefore, let the government do the things that it ought to do. Nobody else can do. Let the government create the level playing field and conditions. Let the government build infrastructure and demand outcomes. Let the government punish the guilty and protect the innocent. But let the people do what can be done to improve the quality of life. Running businesses. Take telecom sector. When I resigned from government, I had to ring up the then member of parliament, Rajasekhar Reddy, because his son was a tenant, early a tenant of the office that I leased out for Lok Sattha. His business failed at the time because, you know, his father was not a chief minister, therefore his businesses did fail at that time. The moment the father became chief minister, all his businesses became super successful, bigger than Tata or Birla. But the telephones were not yet disconnected. So I rang up Rajasekhar to say, look, your son's telephones are still here. Will you please allow me to retain them? I'll pay you whatever costs are incurred. As, a mem as an MP, you can get a telephone from MP's quota. In those days, the MPs were getting phones in their MP's quota, and we had to beg. And I was not an ins inconsequential person. I was a very well-known public servant in Andhra Pradesh by 1996. I was hugely respected. I had lakhs of people who were willing to stand by me at that time. And yet I had to beg a member of parliament for a telephone. He could not oblige me, but we had a long conversation. Finally, it took me some two, three months to get a telephone. Today, how many of you have telephones? Will please raise hands. How many of you have telephones? Raise hands. Everybody, right? Some have two. Did you beg anybody? Did you have to wait? Did you have to bribe anybody? Is the telephone service of reasonable quality, of good quality actually? No? You're not getting calls connected? 
You go to America or Britain, you'll understand. Ours is one of the best telephone systems and the cheapest in the world. Why did that happen? Because of Sarkar? Because Sarkar created a level playing field and said, now you provide the services and you survive or you perish. You don't require more examples. So people who are talking about government monopolies even today are talking about xenophobia. Xenophobia was a result of foreign oppression for a long time. My generation and they, our predecessors, they all were meek people, afraid of white skin. We were all feeling inferior to the foreigners. We always thought America or Britain was great and we were inferior. But your generation has a swagger and confidence. You can beat anybody in the world. Now, America is...